Good morning, Santosh. Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. How are you, sir? Good. I'm fine. Good morning. Good morning. So, heat, heat over here is coming down. Uh, all schools uh, vacation was extended till this week. I see. Because of well, uh, we have we are having a heat wave. It's <laughs> really hot today. I think it's forty plus. Heat index is forty four. Oh, well, it's slowly coming down. We had rain last down. week. Oh, okay. So it, it will, it's going to only increase from what they said. Next two months will be hot box here. The monsoon is slightly delayed uh, this year, but uh, yeah, that's the, that's what I read in the that's mm -hmm. what I read in the news. But, but the cyclone which uh, developed is going towards Pakistan, Gujarat, and Pakistan. <laughs> So I not see. much rains here. So probably from next week, Kerala will start having rain. Yeah, that's what I read. That uh, third week in June is when the monsoon is going to come mm. to the coast. Yes, sir. Anyway, have a good meeting. I'll be listening and talk to you later. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Mas, shall we start? Yes, sir. So is my screen visible and I'm audible, sir? Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'll be uh, today uh, speaking about management of MCL injuries of uh, a knee. Uh, in this article by Chen and Co, uh, 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 they, product, they uh, uh, divided the management of MCL as we all know that uh, should be, we will be addressing it in uh, chronic scenarios uh, and most of them are conservatively managed. And uh, what are the operative indications of this same? Uh, repair and uh, repair with augmentation and what are the options available in chronic MCL insufficiencies uh, that is reconstruction. Uh, in another article by Halinan, uh, while randomizing 50 patients uh, with the MCL management, operatively and non-operative management of MCL injury uh, uh, with uh, uh, early ACL reconstruction. This is a pro prospective randomized study. Uh, out of 50 patients, so they came to a conclusion that uh, either patients did not have any difference in functional outcomes, or those managed operatively or non-operatively. So they concluded that ACL reconstruction without MCL uh, uh, repair uh, in early phases had similar outcomes. So they uh, discouraged uh, repairing uh, MCL. Um, as we all know that uh, classification of MCL by uh, American Medical Association into three grades and uh, uh, sub subdivision of uh, third grade into a further three grades, though uh, in this article by Hadi and Co, uh, they advocated that this classification does not give us an idea about uh, uh, management option with respect to classification. So they tried to classify the MCL uh, uh, injuries into five categories. Uh, um, as shown in the tabular column and subsequently explained. Type 1, they uh, called it as pre-avulsion phase, wherein uh, there is a contusion of the uh, condyle, femoral condyle at, at its attachment. So they advocated this to be managed uh, conservatively. Uh, type 2 was a, a proximal avulsion uh, from the uh, femoral side. Uh, they uh, suggested it to be operated managed. Uh, type 3 was the intrasubstance uh, tear and uh, this is uh, the uh, subclassification which usually comes under KD3M classification and this is where the debate of conservatively manage, um, uh, management and uh, operative management uh, comes in and uh, the authors left that uh, um, uh, inconclusive uh, uh, suggestion as well. Uh, type 4 was a, a version of the uh, tibial attachment of the MCL. Uh, uh, it may be pony or not, uh, or the intrasubstance uh, version. So uh, the author suggested it to be operatively managed. And uh, type 5, they uh, called it as uh, uh, sleeve version of uh, the tibial uh, attachment of the MCL, where uh, there is uh, 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 button holding of the condyle uh, as seen here. Uh, in the clinical pick and uh, this is how the bottle holding of the uh, content through the uh, capsule because uh, they call it as type 5 and uh, they advocate it to be managed operatively. 
uh, now management of acute uh, uh, injuries of mcl so uh, what are the options are uh, we have so uh, non surgical options and surgical options uh, and what does the literature say about this and if at all if it's a non surgical management how do you manage it and uh, if it's surgical manage how do we uh, manage it we will try to uh, answer some of the questions in this article by carlos and co they defined a tabular column uh, to uh, uh, guide us uh, with regards to management of mcl injury they suggested that uh, if there is isolated injury grade 1 and grade 2 american uh, medical association they uh, advocated conservative management and the grade 3 if uh, no, a varus alignment or normal they still advocated uh, uh, conservative management and if valves or some uh, uh, mcl entrapment features will will, will be discussing in for the slides and those kind of uh, exclusive uh, uh, bony avulsions or uh, stener lesions uh, those have to be managed with uh, acute repair uh, another subset uh, which uh, the author uh, uh, classified is combined mcl and acl injuries where the three school of thoughts with the conservative management of mcl and delayed acl reconstruction early mcl reconstruction with conservative management of mcl uh, this is uh, what we follow in our institution and uh, early acl reconstruction and uh, mcl uh, repair uh coming to some uh, uh, literature review about conservative management of uh, mcl way back in 1981 since then uh, uh, garrick and co they evaluated 70 knees and uh, with grade 1 and grade 2 mcl injuries and in the grade 1 uh, injury patients they return to sport only in uh, 10 days and uh, grade 2 return to sport in uh, uh, 20 days as uh, uh, suggested in this article published in ajsm so this signifies that mcl was managed conservatively since long and uh, in this article by farzad and uh, co where they reviewed uh, the current concepts and management uh, uh, in mcl injuries uh, they uh, suggested one article uh, they mentioned one article by halin and again uh, where uh, mcl non operative management uh, was uh, uh, more or less similar had the similar results when they were managed operatively and non operative management uh, same author again uh, concluded uh, did another study where they said that mcl non operative management was associated with better uh, knee function in first 9 uh, uh, months post operatively Uh, so uh, the 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 same author in their uh, article uh, mentioned about the operative indications of uh, uh, mcl which we should be concentrating upon and uh, we should keep the keep this in mind they divided the indications of mcl uh, uh, repair operative management of mcl repair into two subheadings uh, a history and clinical examination uh, indications and radiological indications open mcl injuries um, uh, medial uh, knee uh, laxity with varus stress uh, uh, and uh, amri uh, multiple uh, ligament uh, knee injuries and then uh, chronic mcl tears uh, which are uh, uh, treated conservatively but uh, which had instability symptoms and radiological indications uh, uh, would be val uh, valgus malalignment the tibia plateau fracture stena type lesion stena type lesion is nothing but uh, the attachment of the distal uh, part of mcl comes above the pes structures so that uh, it's hindering the healing process uh, large MC large bony avulsions uh, Uh, or entrapment of the mcl uh, intraarticularly so these are some peculiar uh, indications which uh, uh, without a second thought uh, we would think about uh, uh, operative management as per this article uh, so after uh, defining some uh, answers to the uh, questions asked uh, will be uh, going further with uh, Uh, with how uh, if at all uh, non operative management is done and what are the what are some key points we should uh, uh, keep in mind in this article by laprad uh, uh, published in journal of orthopedic and uh, sport uh, physical therapy they defined a protocol uh, for uh, conservative management of mcl they divided it into uh, four phases uh, where first phase had uh, was for one to two weeks where they uh, stressed upon cryo uh, weight bearing as tolerated and uh, knee bending as tolerated but they advocated use of uh, Hinge knee brace, uh, uh, which would provide the uh, sagittal uh, plane uh, stability. Uh, phase two was continuing of the uh, same, but uh, progress progressive isokinetics and uh, step ups were done. Uh, phase three for about uh, five weeks, hinge knee brace has to be continued for uh, totally six weeks, and uh, crutch has to be uh, started weaning off from this time. At the end of six weeks, uh, there should not be any crutch. Strengthening sport specific uh, exercises and gait correction has to be done. 
Uh, so if it's confusing to uh, make it short, a hinge knee brace is what the author advocated and achieving 90 degree in the initial one month uh, uh, is what has to be kept in mind when conservatively managing uh, uh, MCL. Uh, this is uh, operative management of MCL where uh, the uh, where in this article published in 2018, uh, distal uh, knee MCL repair with suture anchors by Trofa and Co. Uh, they, in their article, suggested that uh, bony avulsion should always be fixed and it should be uh, operatively managed. And uh, with proper indic after proper indications have been defined and MCL is decided to be repaired. So uh, they, uh, the, this surgery is divided into two parts where MCL repair is initially done and it is augmented with uh, sutures, uh, uh, suture tape. Uh, uh, here, uh, this is what they approach and MCL being taken up and fixed with the uh, suture anchor as shown in the uh, picture. They further extended uh, the procedure with uh, uh, attachment of uh, fiber tape uh, in the femoral attachment and augmenting. And this uh, fixation was uh, more or less like how we uh, fix MPFL in our institution. Like it should not be over tightened and there is a, a counter uh, kept uh, to check the over tightening of the uh, augment as shown in this uh, picture. And also the isometry, how we check. Uh, and this is how the isometry is checked by the authors uh, uh, in this particular uh, procedure. Uh, another article by James and Co, uh, Postomedial Corner Injury Knee Dislocation, uh, uh, they uh, concluded that isolated MCL repairs had a failure rate of 20% and augmentation of uh, uh, that uh, would decrease the failure rate up to uh, 4%, uh, which was uh, significant. Uh, coming to the MCL reconstruction part, uh, we'll, uh, in this article by Prince and Co, they indicate they defined some indications and one indications for MCL reconstruction. They said multiligamentous knee injury and uh, injury to the associated structures, uh, uh, valgus instability, and they said that the contraindications are uh, isolated MCL injuries which had the potential to heal con uh, by conservative management. This is what we should uh, keep in uh, mind. Uh, while uh, approaching MCL injury. Uh, the re the uh, concept of reconstruction of the MCL started way back in 1952 by Bosworth, where uh, he transplanted the semi-T uh, semi for, for the repair of the laceration of the MCL of knee, uh, published in JBJS uh, in 1952. And this is uh, one part, although I did, uh, we did not re uh, retrieve the original article of Possible, but it's mentioned in other uh, articles as shown in the schematic representation where distal part of uh, a semi T is attached and uh, uh, it is detached from this muscular tendinous junction and uh, proximally it is attached to the femoral and as shown in the uh, picture. And extension to the uh, to this uh, Bosworth technique uh, was done and modified and called it as modified Bosworth technique, where uh, distal attachment is same and uh, the uh, first process is re repeated uh, with uh, femoral attachment uh, being done by uh, doubling the uh, uh, semi T at uh, the isometric point uh, at, uh, at its uh, proximal extent and extending that uh, graft down and then uh, reconstructing the PO as shown in the picture. So uh, here the superficial and the MCL, uh, superficial and deep fibers of the MCL were reconstructed along with the uh, POL. This is known as the modified Bosworth uh, uh, technique. Uh, some other uh, techniques are also defined, uh, but not so popular. Uh, Kim's technique were uh, uh, similar uh, semi tendinous, uh, 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 semi T tendon is uh, uh, left intact distally and proximally stripped from muscular tendinous duction. Uh, this proximally it is fixed at the ephemeral uh, 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 femoral isometric point and uh, the ex extension of it is attached to the semi uh, tendinosis tendon. This is known as Kim's technique, Kim's technique, and this was again uh, further modified as uh, Stanard's technique or modified Kim's technique, where uh, the without attaching it to the uh, semi tendinous tendinous uh, semi membranous tendon, it is attached to the attachment of the uh, same uh, uh, tendon. Uh, in this article by Reha and Co, uh, they uh, defined, though it's uh, mentioned in many articles, uh, uh, this is one of them. They defined the reconstruction of the uh, MCL by uh, three principles. Uh, one is a single bundle reconstruction as shown here. Uh, two is uh, double bundle reconstruction, but non-anatomical. And uh, three is uh, double bundle reconstruction uh, anatomical. Uh, first is uh, 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 the single bundle reconstruction as defined by Yoshia. Uh, uh, in 
in this article by uh, MCL reconstruction using autologous hemi uh, uh, hamstring tendon. This is more like uh, harvesting the hamstring graft as we do for ACL and then uh, reconstructing the uh, same through isometric points as shown in the picture uh, with uh, fixation uh, uh, as defined in this picture with suspensory fixation distally and uh, aperture fixation proximally. Uh, this is from their original uh, uh, article. Uh, Watson, uh, they also uh, defined one technique where they uh, uh, use suspensory fixation for uh, both the uh, uh, side uh, reconstructions as defined in this uh, picture. Uh, another popular uh, uh, reconstruction method was uh, Lynch method where uh, the uh, distal extent of uh, hamstring is left uh, intact uh, and uh, the graft isometric point is identified on the uh, fem femur and uh, it's doubled and the aperture fixation is done at, the, at that uh, point and the PUL reconstruction is done from posteromedial to uh, Antomedial uh, tunnel in the uh, tibia. So this is the schematic representation and the clinical representation in the article mentioned in Lind. Uh, another popular uh, uh, reconstruction method is defined by Leprad. Leprad is of the opinion that the asymmetric points should be at the anatomical position, not at the hamstring attachment. So this is a free graph from uh, hamstrings and. Uh, Anatomical double bundle reconstruction is then as, the, as shown in this uh, uh, picture that uh, POL uh, from its uh, point in relation to the uh, ga gastro tubercle and uh, the uh, capsule extension of the semi is identified and POL is reconstructed uh, and MCL is reconstructed uh, with uh, proximally uh, at its attachment in relation to the medial epicondyle uh, proximally and uh, uh, superior to it and then 6 cm distal to the uh, MCL. This is basically reconstructing the uh, superficial uh, MCL. And uh, this is a clinical picture uh, defined in the Laprade uh, article. And this schematic representation of the uh, same. Uh, another technique defined by Amit Joshi, uh, uh, weaver's technique. Uh, basically, this is uh, not too different, but they weaved the uh, uh, harvested uh, uh, semi uh, tea. Uh, and they weaved it through the uh, substance of the MCL uh, as shown in this picture and then taken out uh, and uh, uh, passed on to the proximal uh, uh, site attached and then the same is turned down to reconstruct the PO. Uh, if it is confusing, then we can see the schematic representation how the uh, uh, proximal muscular tendinous detachment is done and weaved through the MCL. Uh, the remnant of the MCL and uh, proximally taken up and then fixed at the uh, femur and then taken down uh, to reconstruct the uh, POL. Uh, comparing this uh, weaver's technique, uh, Amit Joshisa's technique uh, with the other techniques, Laprad is what the double bundle uh, anatomical reconstruction and this is how the uh, it is weaved and then extended to the poor reconstruction. Though uh, they have mentioned some pearls and pitfalls of the same, uh, weaver technique provides more anatomical superficial MCL uh, reconstruction and uh, better uh, uh, outcome as per the author, but there are certain short pulse uh, of it. A deep MCL is not constructed. Uh, uh, somebody who is having uh, thin and short uh, semi uh, uh, would not be uh, uh, suitable candidates for this kind of uh, reconstruction. Uh, coming to the uh, other concepts of MCL reconstruction is by using allografts as defined by Robert. They used uh, uh, um, uh, semi tendi uh, tendo achilles uh, allografts are the same and they uh, suggested that the, this study was uh, this study was done in 24 patients and they concluded that uh, this provides a, a favorable clinical outcome uh, uh, in this kind of uh, patients uh, other uh, uh, modifications is uh, uh, using uh, 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 Biopraise, a uh, synthetic uh, uh, collagen rich uh, uh, synthetic material. Uh, this principle of uh, this material is that it provides a biological media uh, for the uh, generation of the tissue in the medial side uh, to give uh, stability. And this is fixed as uh, uh, fixed uh, any other uh, tissue with suture anchors. And this is the biobraze as uh, uh, mentioned in this article. And this is the final uh, reconstruction uh, uh, image of the same, although uh, that's not so popular. And uh, uh, the author suggested that this would provide a promising result in the uh, future. Uh, coming, to the, uh, coming to some uh, uh, biomechanics of the reconstruction of uh, uh, 
MCL reconstruction. Uh, in this article by MCL reconstruction, uh, graft isometry is affected more by femur position than by tibia position published in Casta by Crystal, uh, uh, Christoph. They concluded uh, that uh, reconstruction by hamstring based distally attached graft does not change the biomechanical properties of the graft as much as uh, uh, that would have if the isometry is not achieved at the uh, femur uh, side. And they also concluded that uh, PUL reconstruction should always uh, be fixed in extension. Uh, as we can see in uh, this uh, schematic representation, this is the normal uh, superficial and deep MCL and uh, the extent of the uh, PUL as shown in the uh, picture. After uh, various methods, uh, the lens procedure or uh, Laprage procedure, uh, they uh, suggested that uh, the movement of the uh, knee uh, pivots around the tibial attachment and this is where the excessive stresses happen. So, a minute change in the isometric point of the femoral attachment will have a, a, a rampant different uh, uh, biomechanical effect on the uh, graft. So, they advocated that uh, uh, taking an anatomical uh, reconstruction or uh, the distally attached hamstring reconstruction does not have uh, much difference until and unless the isometry, isometric point is achieved as near as possible to the original uh, attachment of the uh, MCL. Uh, some take-home message. Uh, uh, in acute scenarios, uh, isolated MCL injuries, uh, grade 1 and 2 can be managed conservatively. Grade 3, debatable. Uh, if it's varus and uh, normal alignment, uh, can be again conservatively managed. And if it's varus alignment or uh, MCL entrapment or bony avulsion, as mentioned earlier, it should be acutely uh, repaired. Uh, MCL, MCL uh, injuries with ACL is again uh, controversial. Uh, some advocate early ACL uh, reconstruction and then MCL repair. Uh, some advocate uh, uh, ACL reconstruction is conservative management. Uh, some wait and watch for MCL healing and then uh, reconstruction ACL at a uh, later stage. In multi ligamentous uh, uh, scenarios, uh, MCL is most commonly uh, repaired, uh, but uh, uh, it can sometimes it can like some uh, advocate it to be. Uh, uh, conservatively uh, managed and then the delayed ACL PCL reconstruction. Uh, MCL repair when the PCL reconstruction and delay, delayed uh, PCL reconstruction or uh, addressing uh, all the three ligament, uh, three ligaments at once. Uh, in chronic scenarios, uh, valgus stability has to be assessed. If varus uh, valgus alignment is there, then uh, varus distal femoral osteotomy has to be uh, considered and uh, normal or uh, varus alignment. Uh, reconstruction, uh, MCL reconstruction or oligarch reconstruction can be done, but most commonly MCL reconstruction by autographs as uh, explained uh, is uh, considered. In uh, chronic scenarios, if there is valgus uh, instability uh, with ACL reconstruction, so, uh, MCL reconstruction uh, plus or minus augmentation is to be uh, done uh, at a later stage uh, before uh, uh, after addressing ACL reconstruction. Uh, so, if at all, if acute repair is indicated, time of surgery is important uh, because uh, uh, it's difficult to uh, primarily repair at a uh, later stage. So, uh, timing is important, we should keep in mind. And if at all, we have some uh, uh, suboptimal repair uh, in top, uh, we should consider augmentation, which has to be uh, uh, planned beforehand. Uh, Distally uh, uh, based distally attached based hamstring uh, uh, reconstruction are uh, good uh, uh, options uh, uh, as uh, mentioned in the uh, biomechanical studies. Uh, Laprage, Laprage uh, uh, technique is biomechanically more stable uh, because it, uh, uh, it addresses the anatomical uh, points uh, uh, while reconstruction and uh, uh, further stage has to be uh, uh, done on the same. Uh, Allografts and synthetic uh, grafts, uh, as mentioned in the article, they have uh, not become popular and uh, further studies are needed uh, to uh, uh, until unless we uh, follow the uh, same. Thank you. Master, it is a <coughs> wide topic, uh, well covered in a short uh, duration. Um, You've covered uh, all the points uh, which is required. Your take-home message was complete. Um, only one thing which I would like to add is uh, in a chronic setting, did you come across any kind of uh, cap those capsular procedures? Did you elaborate on that? Mm, no, no, sir. I was uh, mostly speaking on MCL. 
So what do you, yeah, MCL in the, in this chart, flow chart, the right side, second box, can you see capsular procedures? Yes, yes. Can you point that out? Yes. So in the chronic setting, there is something called the capsular procedures. Uh, so yes, what do you think it is? Did you come across? Mas? So, so in a chronic setting, one you said about osteotomy, all, all the rest you covered, the capsular procedures, did you understand that? Or any, anybody else uh, know about this? S sir, uh, sir, I'm uh, unable to hear you, sir. You're not able to hear me, sorry. The capsular procedures, what exactly are those capsular procedures? It, 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 sir? What are the capsular procedures? Am I audible? Voice getting stuck, sir. No, you're well audible, uh, Sandosh. Okay. Uh, so, others, capsular... others, what are the capsular I mean... procedures? Any other fellows can answer this? Okay. Uh, we can do a reefing uh, of the tightening of the capsule. Yeah, even exactly. So in an acute situation, all the MCL will be torn. In a chronic situation, all the MCL structures would have healed, but an entire medial sleeve of structures would have healed in a lax position. So. Um, so when you when you just do a reconstruction, your your entire force is going to be on the reconstructed uh, tendon. I mean uh, graft. So capsular procedures are the ones which tighten the native uh, MCL because the MCL is lax. When you do the medial opening, you can see the entire medial structure is kinking and becoming flabby. So with that, you will be able to know where exactly it is loose. You can actually tighten it by uh, cutting it and double breasting it. Uh, it can be done. Uh, proximal to distal or uh, posterior to anterior, depending on where the laxity is. So in, in description, you usually describe a double breasting posterior over the anterior, which tightens the POL and uh, superficial MCL. It can be done um, proximal and distal also, which is more uh, anterior fibers usually get lax uh, when they open out in flexion. So the capsular procedure is also very, very important. Uh, to tighten the native structures or it, 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 when you when this procedure is done you have to elevate the entire medial structures like when we do an osteotomy hto we elevate the entire medial uh, structures of the bone similar to that we have to elevate the entire structure then uh, uh, tighten it uh, double breast it and then add an augmentation or a reconstruction it's called augmentation because you do it along with the capsular tightening um, rather than doing just an MCL reconstruction, I would always prefer to do a capsular procedure along with augmentation because you're tightening the native MCL, which heals onto the bone, which is more robust uh, than the reconstruction alone. And so you have to be aware of the capsular procedures in chronic setting. So always freshen the capsule and tightening uh, will, is what I would advocate rather than doing a reconstruction alone. I mean, which may be in a subacute sub situation, it might be helpful, but in a chronic situation, you have to add a capsular procedure. Apart from this point, Santosh, sir, may I give throw my two cents in? Sure, sure, sure. Uh, the MCL has a deep and a superficial part. Uh, sometimes the deep is torn and the superficial is stretched, and you can test that by laxity in extension, as compared to. Uh, laxity and flexion when superficial and deep are both torn. Years ago, they had described a procedure called the MOCK, M-A-U-C-K procedure, which is really a capsular reconstruction by raising an osteoperiosteal flap and putting the original uh, ligament underneath and stapling it. And I have done that uh, in my training program because at that time, some of the newer techniques were not available. 
mock procedure. The fellows can look it up and uh, uh, that's a capsular reconstruction. It's capsular reefing, like Amar said. So how, how are the results of those procedures, sir? Well, those days we thought everything was good. You know, people never report your bad results. <laughs> <laughs> We've done a few <laughs> cases which, which, which actually are robust and heal really well um, with these chronic... Yes, uh, if the patient is young and uh, have had a chronic laxity and the capsular part or the deeper collateral ligament is stretched or torn or both, uh, they really work well. And you can test it in extension on the operating table. We used a metallic staple those days to put the osteoperiostal flap back. They didn't have the suture anchor then. So no, they used but, to staple, yeah. yeah. A lot of importance right. used to be given for capsule earlier. Now also relevant in the right uh, places. Yeah. We, we even used it in the shoulder, David, for uh, multiplied procedures. <laughs> yeah. So, sorry, I missed the first two slides, first few slides. Did uh, Mars... Uh, 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 emphasize the importance of uh, uh, tear uh, proc the, or the MCL proximally or distally or a different topic altogether, already been covered. Uh, sir, uh, 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 I told that in uh, the uh, uh, no, you, you mentioned about conservative treatment, didn't you? And yes, this sir. includes that also. Yeah, he did. Uh, the, uh, well, the importance of uh, uh, the site of tear, is it, is it femoral or, or tibial? The importance, uh, did he highlight? I'm sorry, I missed that too. If he had already done it, we will we'll skip and go. If you have not done it, uh, Santosh can uh, yeah. no, he, he did quickly. The femoral side uh, heals uh, well uh, compared with, with tibia. Uh, and both heal, but femoral heals uh, better. That's the point so wants to convey. I thought tibial side doesn't heal so well, and you have to uh, look at it surgically. No, not all tibia, sir. Tibia mm. stenas, uh, even tibia heals. Femoral heals mm. better than tibia. Uh, tibia stenas do not heal. Uh, I mean, tibial sides. Uh, if there is interposition and if it's uh, uh, pulled off or folded, then surgical intervention is uh, mandatory. But tibial side, uh, there are mixed literature. So tibial side, there are people who augment and uh, repair all of them. We used to do that before, but now mm. we're not doing that uh, because tibial uh, do heal okay. if it's in place. Mm. It's not uh, moved away. So. Thank you. This classification, uh, like while uh, uh, the type one was pre avulsion, like on the femoral side, uh, this obviously conservative management, this is avulsion of the femur side. So, here uh, they mentioned that this has to be managed conservatively, though uh, the proponents of operative management operate, but mostly conservative management only. So, type two, uh, this is management uh, 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 prospective uh, classification. And uh, again, mid substance, uh, uh, the conservative management, and uh, some would operate. Uh, um, uh, Surgically, they told, but uh, conservative management till uh, uh, type three and type four and five operative management. That is what was mentioned. Uh, depending upon the site of, uh, I would like to all all the fellows who are not uh, in our particular unit to see that uh, medical student has been arbitrated. Examine him, look at the MRI, and so relevant to the talk today. Yes, sir. Yes. What's the name of that patient? So, Raul, Arun. If I'm not wrong, it's Sanjay, sir. Um... Yeah, okay, thank you.
So good morning, everyone. Uh, am I audible? Uh, are my slides visible? Yeah, my please go on. Uh, good morning, everyone. My topic is uh, the multilegamentous injuries, timing, sequence, and fixation. Uh, the multilegamentous injuries they are defined as injury to two or more of the four major ligaments. That is the ACL, PCL, uh, the posterior medial uh, corner, and the posterior lateral corner ligaments. Any uh, two of out of these four major ligaments is called as a multilegamentous injury. Mechanism injury uh, ranges from a high energy trauma like a motor vehicle accident or a fall from height to uh, low energy traumas called sports injuries, uh, like sports injuries or ultra low energy traumas, especially in obese individuals. Uh, it's a rare injury. Uh, the classification uh, was given by uh, Schenk et al. And uh, it's called the KD classification. Type one is uh, where uh, dislocation includes a disruption of either of the cruciate ligaments. Type two is uh, when dislocation uh, with the cruciate, with uh, both cruciate ligaments. KD3 is uh, dislocation with the cruciate ligaments plus either MCL or LCL, which can be further divided into 3M and 3L based on whether the medial side or the lateral side is injured. Uh, then KD4 is dislocation of both the ligaments and both the collaterals, and KD5 is plantar dislocation. Uh, one uh, drawback is that it does not include the trauma. Uh, to the soft tissue envelope extensor mechanism and other injuries which can decide the prognosis of the multilegamentous injury. So when a multilegamentous injury patient comes to us or a suspected multilegamentous injury comes to us, so what should be the emergency room protocol? First of all, all high velocity injuries, uh, knee injuries should be uh, suspected to have a multilegamentous injury because many times they will come uh, with spontaneous uh, 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 reduction. So we should, uh, <coughs> Well, uh, examine carefully. In case it's a, a, a dislocated patient comes to the comes to the ER, then it should be carefully uh, repositioned, and uh, it should be <clears throat> before attempting any formal reduction or repositioning. We should get a radiograph. That is very important. Unless unless the uh, this is severely compromising the soft tissue envelope. For example, there is an, it's a it's tenting on the skin or about to uh, pierce the skin, then we can attempt a gentle repositioning before an X-ray. Uh, uh, checking the vascularity and neuro neurological status is paramount. And uh, as I said, X-ray is very important. So how to reduce it? Uh, based on the uh, radiograph and the direction of dislocation, we, there are different maneuvers. Preferably, they should be done under anesthesia. And after reduction, to test for the ligamentous injury, uh, all. Uh, we can do uh, different tests, but care should be taken that only the tests which involve minor knee manipulation, like the virus and valgus test or the Lachman test should be done. And we should not do tests uh, that involve greater uh, knee manipulation, like the posterior lateral drawer or the uh, pivot shift test, which can cause further damage. So when we have uh, received the patient, we've done the reduction, what should be the protocol after that? First and foremost is a post-reduction X-ray should be done. Then we can do an MRI or CT to assess the degree of uh, damage. Uh, stress radiography in select cases. Uh, and most important, to see the distal pulses in the ABP, ABPI for first uh, 72 hours. Examining the distal pulses is very important because they are uh, uh, seldom associated with the, they're often associated with the neurovascular injury. So uh, this is a paper. Uh, by ST Sarovar uh, from uh, University of Pittsburgh. They basically gave a protocol of management of acute knee dislocation. Uh, they mentioned that in case there is no indication for an emergency surgery, uh, uh, they can, it can be the multilegamentous injury can be immobilizing few uh, uh, knee extension, full extension in a brace for some time before a plan is made, unless there is an emergency intervention. So one of these emergency intervention is uh, knee dislocation or a multilegament injury with a vascular injury. So this is the protocol that we should follow if we are suspecting a vascular injury. Uh, after the reduction, uh, we should check the perfusion if it's well perfused or whether it's still ischemic. If the limb is well perf perfused and pulse is present, then uh, we have to check the ABPI whether it's more than 0.9 or less than 0.9. If the pulse is absent, then we have to straight away go for a CT engine. And uh, if even if the pulse is present, but the ABP is less than 0.9, again, we have to go for a CT angio. In case of ischemic limb, uh, limb we have to directly uh, plan for the uh, 
uh, exploration of the vessel. So this is an image showing a uh, popliteal artery injury in a CT angio and a repair being performed. Uh, other cases of uh, emergency management of multi-ligaments injury are cases with the compartment syndrome, cases uh, uh, with uh, open dislocation, cases grossly unstable fracture dislocations. So uh, when we receive a patient with acute MLK uh, multi-ligament injury, uh, which doesn't need an emergency inter intervention, there are three ways where how it can be dealt with. It can be either repaired in a single stage uh, with repair of collateral, repair or reconstruction of collateral and cruciate ligaments. We can do a stage uh, ligament surgery where in an acute phase, we can do a repair and uh, augmentation of the collateral, followed by se subsequent second stage uh, uh, reconstruction of the cruciate ligaments. Or we can do an acute phase immobilization, then followed by a delayed reconstruction. Again, the delayed reconstruction can be a single stage or a, a, a multi -sta double stage process. So there has been a, a lot of controversy going on in the, in the past regarding whether they should be repaired early or late. Uh, this paper in 2009 uh, by Bruce Levy et al. Uh, they basically did a systematic review. Uh, they reviewed five studies and they found out that Patients undergoing surgery within three weeks have shown a higher return to sports as compared to others who underwent the surgery uh, more than that. Uh, the reason that they gave was that uh, after three weeks, the soft tissue planes are lost and there's a lot of fibers and this difficult uh, uh, to, the anatomy becomes difficult. Another study came in 2017. Uh, they basically uh, reviewed eight studies. Uh, 149 patients were treated early and 11 late. And they again found out that early surgical intervention produces a better clinical outcome. This uh, paper uh, was from India. They uh, did a stage reconstructive surgery. Uh, here, what they did was uh, they did in three stages. In first stage, if it's a stage one, uh, grade one or two collateral uh, ligament injury, they managed it conservatively. Whether if it was a grade three, they did a primary repair. Then in second stage, they did an ACL reconstruction. It was only ACL, but if it had ACL and PCL, they, they reconstructed the PCL first and then again waited. And if the patients had no symptoms of instability, then they, uh, they continued with it and didn't do an ACL reconstruction. They, uh, they did this for 21 patients. They have a data of 21 patients. And out of those 21, six did not require an ACL reconstruction. Uh, another uh, paper came in 2014. Uh, this uh, was uh, uh, from Wu Jiang and group. Uh, they found out that 79% of patients who were uh, uh, who underwent a stage treatment had good results, uh, whereas a simultaneous treatment, acute cases only uh, about 60% and chronic cases 45% had good results. So they were kind of favoring the stage treatment. Now, this is the latest of the papers. It, it came out in 2019 from the Prad group. In this, they recommend that a single stage reconstruction with immediate rehab has shown a significant improvement in ligament uh, in uh, return to sports pattern in sports person. Now, what are the uh, proponents? Why, how early should it be done? Uh, the authors, have, there is a lot of uh, controversy still, but most of the authors have reached the conclusion that the repair should be done between two to three weeks. Uh, the reason for that is if done too early, uh, there because of the uh, soft tissue injury and uh, collateral injury, there can be a lot of fluid extravasation and uh, the surgery becomes really difficult. Whereas if you give it two to three weeks, between two to three weeks, the, uh, the collaterals might heal and then it subsequently surgery becomes easy. And uh, not to wait more than three weeks again because the soft tissue planes becomes, uh, become difficult to delineate. Uh, now coming to the chronic multi-ligament injury. So in a chronic scenario, uh, we again we are again faced with three situations. First is a chronic ligament injury with a reduced knee. Second is a chronic uh, situation with an unreduced knee. A reduced knee again can be divided into two groups. It can be either associated with malalignment or uh, no malalignment. If there is no malalignment, then we can manage it again with a multiple ligament reconstruction, single or stage, depending on the surgeon preference. And if it has a uh, malalignment, then the first focus should be correction of that malalignment with or without tibial slope modification. And then we should focus on the ligamentous reconstruction. Uh, whereas if it is uh, unreduced, then we have to do an open reduction, uh, put a hinge fixator, uh, and then do a, a ligamentous reconstruction 
either in the same state or in a delayed in the later state. Now, why do correct the deformity is important? This was a paper that came out in 2007. Uh, they said that in 21, uh, they had a case of uh, case load of 21 with combined PLC deficiency plus virus deformity. And uh, they, they showed that in eight out of 21 patients, uh, an osteotomy alone was sufficient and a subsequent PLC reconstruction was not needed. So the osteotomy alone was able to compensate for the instability and patient was uh, improving and his knee function improved. The reason is that if we do a reconstruction without doing an osteotomy, there is a, a unparalleled load on the graft and it will eventually fail. And it has been shown the in the conclusion, they mentioned that low, patients with low velocity injuries and isolated PLC injuries may not require a surgery if the osteotomy has healed properly and he has underwent a, a, pro, a program of rehabilitation. Now, this one, uh, this paper in 2004 uh, by Robert Griffin, uh, he highlighted the importance of tibial slope on biomechanics of the knee. And uh, he showed that an increase in tibial slope uh, uh, causes a significant uh, anterior translation of the tibia under uh, axial compression. So, this can be better explained with the, this diagram. So if we increase the tibial slope, it will reduce the tibial sag. So basically increasing tibial slope will be helpful in a PCL deficient knee as seen in the diagram on the right. And where if we can, if we do a decrease in tibial slope, it will have a reverse effect. It will have a protective effect in the ACL graft and will cause, it will cause a posterior translation of the tibia. Now, uh, when we are faced with a multi-ligamentous injury, one of the important questions is uh, how to select the graft. Again, this question depends on which area we are practicing and do we have access to allografts or not. In the West, mostly they are using uh, a mixture of uh, autograft and allograft or allografts alone, but in India, we are uh, using mostly uh, autografts. So different graphs that can be used and each has its advantages and disadvantages. The advantage of hamstring is that they have adequate length and can be quadrupled to increase the diameter. Uh, BTB has an advantage, can be used in ACL and PCL as an advantage of a robust fixation, uh, same as quadriceps tendon, and then come the allograft. Uh, the advantage of hamstring is that they can be used in multiple ligament situation and mostly in, in India for the collaterals uh, uh, and for the corners, we use the hamstring graphs. Now the third group in the chronic situation, that is the chronic unreduced dislocation. As I already mentioned, the uh, treatment for this is open reduction, a hinge external fixation and stage ligament, uh, plus minus stage ligament reconstruction uh, means can be either dealt at the same setting or we can wait and uh, for soft tissue healing and, and then we can do uh, a ligament, uh, ligament reconstruction. Important factor in this is a complete circumferential release and a scar tissue fixation. This is a hinge fixator that can be used. So hinge fixator, apart from this chronic unreduced dislocation, uh, has also been uh, uh, propagated in acute uh, dislocations and uh, in uh, uh, multi-ligament injuries, which are uh, not chronically uh, unreduced. So this was a paper that came in JBGS. They have mentioned that uh, they basically supplemented, uh, they compared the usage of a hinge fixator with a brace in the cases of uh, knee uh, dislocation, uh, this multi-ligament reconstruction. And they found out that the cases with the uh, in which this uh, supplemented the reconstruction with the hinge fixator had less failed reconstruction uh, as compared to external braces. Though the braces were uh, not advanced at that time and also the fixator has its own uh, disadvantages of the pin tracts of uh, con contracture in the um, quarters of muscles as well as uh, risk of uh, uh, interfering with the future tunnels. So after making a plan, there are certain principles that we have to keep in mind before we go on for a surgery. The important principles are, they should be, we should have a comprehensive knowledge of the anatomy and biomechanics. Surgical planning should be perfect. There should be uh, a close post op monitoring and we should have a phased rehab program in mind. The broad points of technique are that the tibial and femoral tunnels are reamed uh, uh, first and for anatomical double bundle and single bundle ACL, then the chondral and meniscal lesions are addressed, and then open approaches to the posterior lateral and the, the posterior middle corner. 
and finally the crochet followed by the collaterals of past. So when we are faced with such a situation, one of the most important complication that, that can happen is a tunnel convergence because of so many uh, tunnels that are drilled in the femur and tibia, there can be a tunnel convergence which can cause a failure of the surgery. So this is a, a important re uh, paper, review paper by Gilbert Moche. Uh, he basically authored two papers in 2016 uh, in where he uh, gave uh, tips to avoid convergence in femur and tibia. And then he uh, came up with this paper in 2018 where he combined those two papers and gave a, a complete uh, analysis of how to prevent this uh, tunnel uh, convergence. So what he said was when we are uh, uh, doing the drilling the MCL tunnel, we have to be 40 degree proximal and 20 to 40 degree anterior in order to prevent the convergence with an MCL tunnel. And when we are drilling the tunnel for the, the POL, we should be 20 degree proximal, 20 degree anterior. Uh, coming on the lateral side, he said that the uh, FCL and the public descendant tunnel should be 30 to 5 again, 40 degree anteriorly, and this reduces the risk of conversion in the ACL tunnel. Uh, coming to the tibia, he said that the, uh, the POL tunnel should be 15 degree medial to the girdis tubercle. Uh, and if it's yellow, that it's uh, aimed closer to the girdis tubercle, it has chances to converge uh, with the PCL tunnel that is uh, highlighted in green. And on the medial side, uh, and he said that if we aim the MCL tunnel transversely, it has a risk of converging with the uh, PCL tunnel, it should be aimed uh, distally, about 30 degrees. So in summary, in a combined PCL MCL reconstruction, the POL should be aimed 15 degree medial to girdies and MCL aimed 30 degree distally. Whereas in a combined ACL PLC reconstruction, a 40 degree angulation uh, in the axial plane and a zero degree in the coronal plane should be done while doing an LCL and public distant reconstruction. And again, if you are in doubt, we can always use a CR. So we have our own techniques to prevent uh, conversion and uh, we don't use multiple tunnels and we have uh, something called as a conversion tunnel, uh, a single tunnel technique where we uh, use the same tunnels uh, for the uh, ACL and the LCL and uh, uh, then for the PCL and for the MCL and we can continue the same uh, graft over the endo button. Uh, 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 we take a semi tendinous uh, graft, hamstring graft for constructing the uh, PCL and then uh, uh, it has grassless along with it and then after looping the endo button at the femoral condyle, it, uh, the grassless graft is continued and uh, continue, it continues as the MCL. In the same way we do it for ACL and LCL as well. Uh, another important question after passing the grafts is that how the graft should be uh, tensioned. So this paper by uh, Dr. Dinja Patewala uh, came in 2017. He gave this following uh, sequence of passage of grafts. The most important point in this that the PCL double bundle grafts are fixed on the femur and tibia first. Uh, the hi highlight, uh, the importance of this is that PCL forms the central pivot in the knee. So before tightening uh, any other grafts, we should secure the PCL grafts. And this again, uh, I'll tell as I'll tell later that this again is a point why the staged re reconstruction has is slowly got, uh, going out of fashion. And now a single stage multi-ligament reconstruction is the standard of care. So according to this sequence, PCL double bundle grafts are passed, then ACL single bundle grafts are passed and fixed with suspensory uh, fixation. Then the PCL uh, grafts are tightened on femur and tibia. After that, the PLC grafts are fixed, then ACL is tensioned and fixed on tibia. And finally, the medial uh, structures are fixed. So uh, this is a paper that came in bone and joint, Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery. This highlighted the importance of the PCL. This, uh, as I told it, it is the central pillar of knee and reducing the, and fixing the PCL reduces any step off and which can cause a, a lag. For example, if you fix the collaterals before correcting the sag, then when the sag is finally corrected, the collaterals will become lax and eventually fail. Uh, so when the PLC, uh, PCL is tightened, we should be careful that the anterolateral bundle should be tightened at 90 degree and posterior medial at zero degree. Uh, but uh, if you are doing a single bundle, which is done less, we can we have to tighten it at 90 degree. Uh, uh, as I already told, the next is PLC. Now, why PLC is next? Because if we fix the ACL before the PLC, 
there is some amount of tibial external rotation. So this study uh, has shown that in PLC deficient knee, if ACL is tightened, there is increased tibial external rotation. So the PLC has to be fixed first, and then we go on to the ACL, and it's uh, fixed in 30 degree uh, extension and 30 degree of flexion, and then finally MCL and POL are tension. MCL is tension in 30 degree of flexion, whereas POL is tension in uh, full extension. Uh, the next and uh, important step is uh, the rehabilitation. And the rehabilitation is uh, is a core of any uh, orthopedic surgery, and more so in the multi-ligamentous injury. And uh, it, this paper uh, came out in two thousand uh, in uh, two thousand seventeen, and they showed that uh, early mobilization in an acute uh, MLKI had better range of motion and stability. And what they grossly, uh, they basically uh, recommended is an initial period of non-weight bearing, then followed by active mobilization, progressive weight bearing. And this is very similar to what we follow here, which uh, Mr. Paul will uh, explain in some time. So the more, uh, the gross features were that uh, in till eight weeks, there were no active hamstring contraction for PCL. And <clears throat> there was only passive flexion with support to the posterior tibia till six weeks. And for the integrity of the PLC, extension was limited uh, to zero degree. No hyperextension was uh, allowed to, because it can cause stretching. And uh, as uh, Dr. Maaz also said, MCL any valgus force on the knee joint is provided. So this is an important brace called as the Osu brace. And uh, this uh, is an important brace in a rehabilitation protocol. It, it, it basically gives a physiologically uh, dynamic force to the proximal layer. So the TBI it prevents the sagging and it, uh, this load is generated by applying an anteriorly directed force in the calf area. And it has a counterweight on the anterior aspect of the leg. So uh, the take home message from the entire talk is we should always have a high index of suspicion for the neurovascular injuries. Early treatment between two to three weeks gives good results. Uh, single stage management is better uh, than stage management in sports injury. Malalignment should always be corrected before going on to ligament reconstruction and chronic multi-ligaments injury. Uh, steps should be taken to prevent tunnel conversions and we can use a single uh, tunnel technique as we use. And proper sequence while tightening and fixation should be followed. And uh, a guided rehabilitation program uh, must be followed. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Amar. Again, uh, it is well covered. Uh, regarding the sequence and tunnel convergence, um, all all um, I mean in the multi ligament situation, trying to address all the ligaments at one shot is technically challenging. So to begin with, if it is difficult, no harm in doing it staged, where uh, you, you only thing you have to make sure is uh, you you correct the sag before you address the collaterals. So so if at all you want to do it staged <clears throat> do pcl and collaterals in one stage and the rest in the next stage <clears throat> if it's really acute you won't be able to do the pcl then um you have to do ways to if the mcl is badly torn like in strenous lesion you cannot go in late you have to go in early so in those situations you will go address the mcl but make sure you do something like an x-fix or a, a good brace where you keep it corrected in the uh, the sag is in a corrected position. Um, in certain situations where there are abulsion fractures, you have to go in acute. Uh, if you are able, in, in, in an MCL, uh, bad MCL with an PCL abulsion, sometimes you might be able to do it open. Where you open out uh, the medial side, your entire MCL will be ripped off. So you can do an open PCL avulsion fixation or open PCL reconstruction because you can reach the posterior structures, through the open MCL. If the MCL is intact, it will be difficult to reach there. When the MCL is totally torn, it will be easy to reach and you can do an open PCL uh, through the medial approach. So in those situations, you can just address the uh, PCL in an open manner and then uh, repair the MCL or reconstruct the MCL and come out. Then do the rest in stage two. But in stage one, addressing whatever meniscus, if it all not uh, small tears, but the bucket handle tears are flipped, meniscus must be put back in place. Maybe one or two sutures also will help because you're not going to mobilize the patient uh, a lot. 
So to begin with, stage reconstruction is okay. But as you gain the technical skill and uh, your, your your support team and your OT environment and uh, your armamentarium must be there to do all of them in one stage. If, if, if not, no harm in doing it in two stages rather than harming the patient. So, uh, so even though literature and you see here everything done in one stage, two stages is not a problem. We, we also do two stages in certain situations like you would have seen in avulsion situations where you address the avulsions early and do the rest later. Sometimes uh, a PCL might heal on its own. You might not do uh, stage two later on. So uh, all options are open. It's not always uh, one route that you take. Yeah, thank you, sir. Sir, your point, sir. Uh, <clears throat> now you have to counsel the patient properly. You know, very, very important because you cannot uh, give, give the patient 100% uh, normal. Honey. That's very, very important. Otherwise, even if you do an excellent job, in your opinion, uh, your the patient will be very, very unsatisfied. Then, as Dr. Santosh mentioned, very often we find that with the PCL reconstruction and the other side reconstruction, collateral, and in a non athlete, the ACL reconstruction becomes unnecessary. Uh, so, uh, there is a point which you have to bear in mind. Now, you have a vascularity and injury and all that has been over, been emphasized. You have to be aware of all that. So I don't know how many of you know that there's a handheld Doppler in the emergency. Anybody who doesn't know? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, okay, good. Right. Right. Don't hesitate to use it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So good morning, sir. Am I audible? Yeah, Paul. Slides are visible. Visible, no? Okay. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Uh, today I'll be talking about uh, the post-operative rehabilitation after uh, PCL reconstruction. Um, the phases of rehab, uh, there are six stages. Uh, first one is protective phase. Mm, the second one is optimal protection and uh, mobility, ROM. And the third phase is strengthening uh, phase. And the fourth one is proprioception and balance. And fifth is agility and plyometrics. And the sixth phase is sports specific phase. Um, uh, there was a paper published in the International Journal of uh, Sports Physical Therapy. It's, on, uh, it's about a literature review of published protocols. Uh, the purpose of this review was to gather the literature related to PCL rehabilitation and summarize the uh, current rehabilitation guidelines. Uh, from this study, uh, we get to know about the details regarding the weight bearing status, the knee range of motion, uh, the brace usage, uh, specific exercise recommendation and suggestions for return to sport. Uh, uh, these were summarized in this study. So in my today's talk, I'll be comparing our protocol with this uh, study. First is about uh, the post-operative weight-bearing status. Out of uh, 44 studies included in this paper, uh, 35 studies have given recommendation regarding the post-operative weight-bearing status. Um, the 12 studies, uh, 12 studies recommended non-weight-bearing ranging from two weeks to eight weeks. And four studies recommended total weight-bearing uh, dur duration ranging from 10 days to six weeks. And 14 studies recommended partial weight bearing ranging from 20 to 80 percentage and gradually progress to full weight bearing. And uh, six studies recommended full weight bearing or weight bearing to tolerance. And in uh, um, the protocol which we follow, uh, it is non weight bearing for six weeks, followed by partial weight bearing in the seventh and eighth week. And regarding the range of motion, 35 uh, studies have given some recommendation in which 19 studies fall under early range of motion group in which two studies recommend unrestricted range of motion and 13 studies recommended uh, uh, range of motion from zero to 90 degree and gradually progress above 90 degree after two to 10 weeks. 
and two studies uh, suggested or recommended early protective but full range of motion and only two studies we can get the details about the uh, the prone range of motion and in detail uh, delayed uh, range of motion group there were 16 studies and in these studies the range of motion start exercises started only after 2 to 6 weeks uh, in the protocol which we follow we start passive prone knee bending exercise only passive prone knee bending exercise after the second wave after suture removal we start passive prone knee bending with uh, hinge knee brace and supine knee bending will be started after third to fourth week and high sitting range of motion will be starting after fifth or sixth week and the goal to achieve 90 degree is by the end of eighth week next about the post operative bracing 42 studies have given some recommendation in which 30 studies recommend extend uh, the knee has to be immobilized in extension knee brace it is just a long knee brace and only four studies provide details about unlocking and range of motion and the time frame to discontinue brace according to these papers is 8 to 12 weeks and according to our protocol uh, initial two weeks we give long knee brace with posterior tibial support and that's for two weeks and after two weeks we shift them to uh, we give them a hinged motion control knee brace and that has to be worn from second week till four to six months and regarding the strengthening exercise most of the studies they recommend uh, in in the initial phase co contraction exercise of quadriceps and hamstring example mini squat short arc leg presses and this has to be progressed to isolated quadriceps exercise and uh, isolated hamstring strengthening exercises has to be delayed because it has a negative impact on the graft and uh, there are a few studies which uh, actually neglect or ignore uh, isolated hamstring exercises till sixth month. Um, uh, um, about the return to sport, 36 studies have given some recommendation in which two studies recommend four to five months uh, for return to sport and seven, st seven studies, six to seven months and 19 st studies recommend eight to nine months for return to sport and four studies, 10 to 12 months uh, for return to sport. Uh, in our uh, protocol, it is after 12 months, we allow them uh, to participate in sports. Uh, now, regarding the protocol, uh, phase one, that is day one to eight weeks, our goal is to control pain and swelling, improve petla mobility, uh, to improve range of motion up to 90 degrees and maintain a good quadriceps control and monitor soft tissue contracture. Um, so this is the brace which we give. The first one is uh, a long knee brace with posterior tibial support to prevent uh, uh, the tibial sag. And the second one is um, the range of motion brace. Uh, this company is called Visco. Now we are not using it because uh, there is a difficulty in getting fitting it to the patient. We are not getting small and X small sizes. Now we are using a brace called uh, uh, UM brace. And even in that, we are uh, facing some difficulty because the, the straps and the brace is not of that uh, good quality. We have already spoken to the company and they are working on it. Uh, as an alternative, we are using a Tynor brace now. And uh, the, uh, the bed mobility exercises, we start in the initial day one, we start ankle toe movements, isometric quadriceps and hamstrings, followed by uh, bridging. and um, crunches for abdominal muscles then three plane slr uh, that is uh, hip open chain exercises with leg like knee extension slr abduction and extension is done And this is uh, the passive prone knee bending exercise. One hand is placed on the proximal um, calf muscle. A gentle pressure is applied uh, to prevent uh, the posterior translation of tibia and gentle knee bending is performed. 
And once that is done, uh, uh, usually passive pro knee bending, we start after two weeks and supine knee bending, we start after three to four weeks. First week, the range of motion is controlled to 30 degrees, followed by 45 to 60, then 60 to 90 degrees. Uh, phase 2A, it is from two months to four months. Our uh, criteria to progress is there should not be any flexion deformity. The range of motion should be uh, zero to 90 degrees at least, and there should be good quad control. And uh, our goal is to um, correct the gait and start with strengthening exercise. So usually patient comes to us with uh, antalgic gait that is limping or stiff knee gait. In these patients, uh, um, we have to activate the quadriceps muscle, improve range of motion, and in foot, we have to check for proper heel placement and proper takeoff that can correct the gait. And once that is done, from two months onwards, we can start with a resistance band uh, hip open kinetic chain exercise uh, for flexion, abduction, uh, abductors, and extensors. And uh, after two months, we can start with mini squats with support. And initially till 60 degrees and gradually progress to 90 degrees. Once this is comfortable, we can progress with uh, leg press. Initially it is done with uh, a resistance band, but with, but with the brace on. Once the patient is comfortable, we can progress to leg press on the machine. And phase 2B is three months to five months. Again, it's a strengthening phase. And criteria to progress is there should be a good and smooth range of motion, and there should be comfortable symmetrical bilateral loading. In this phase, we start unilateral exercises. Single leg uh, strengthening exercises will be started. So we start with a dumbbell squat, forward step up and side step ups. Then followed by a resistance band terminal extension to strengthen VMO and the quads. And weight shifting exercise, the initial balance training to load the operated leg. So forward and backward movement and lateral movements are performed. The athlete or the patient should be weight bearing on the operated leg. So once they are comfortable, single leg squatting is started initially up to 60 degrees, then uh, progress to 90 degrees and initially with support, then without support. Once they are comfortable with uh, uh, doing the single leg squat without support, we can progress with weights. And after five months to nine months, we can start with balance exercise, running drills and plyometrics. So during this phase, we can use the technology which is available in our department. That is Isomove for uh, strength testing and training and Prokeen to assess dynamic balance and Isoshift to assess uh, functional, uh, do a functional movement screening and to assess static balance. Um, so suggestions. Uh, there are no consensus regarding the rehab guidelines. Uh, since our uh, protocol is strong and we are getting good success with our protocol, we should try publishing our protocol also. And uh, there are a lot of studies which uh, recommend early weight bearing. So should we also consider uh, early weight bearing maybe by four weeks? Uh, and... Um, uh, can we discontinue brace by three months? Now we are discontinuing brace by four to six months. And uh, compliance is also very poor by three months. Uh, the patients are, come and ask to us if they can remove the brace or not. Uh, but we say they have to wear till four to six months. If it is safe, can we consider discontinuing brace by three months? And uh, can we improve range of motion beyond 90 degree gradually after four months? Because uh, even after six to eight months, we have seen PCL patients coming with 
restricted range of motion restricted to 90 degree or 100 degree uh, so if it is safe uh, so we should consider improving the range of motion beyond 90 degree gradually after four months and in our protocol we usually start uh, isolated hamstring exercises in the gym along with isolated quads so maybe uh, we should delay the isolated hamstring exercises by one or two months thank you sir Paul, Paul, uh, thank you. Very, very good uh, evidence-based. Uh, uh, I mean, I wouldn't say it's evidence-based. Very good literature review. But um, all of these reviews are evidence-based or it's just the protocols which they follow. But uh, how successful is the protocol has not been tested, right? Yeah, it is not tested, sir. Mm, okay, so we should uh, be a little careful in adopting it. Can you go yeah. back to your previous slide for all the suggestions? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. So uh, weight bearing, um, what is your suggestion is to start by? Uh, if it is isolated PCL, can we uh, start little early, sir? Yeah, four weeks uh, is okay. Uh, but so, some avulsions and depending on that intraop stability, weight of the patient, we can actually start weight bearing early. That's not a problem, actually. Um, but associated injuries in a multi-ligament situation, where MCL is torn, uh, we cannot start. And then isolated, yes, we can start a little early. Okay, sir. Um, brace, uh, three months is, uh, yeah, okay, we can discontinue the brace. Uh, if, if it's an isolated PCL or PCL avulsion, we discontinue brace even earlier. By six okay. uh, to eight weeks, still we discontinue if it's a bony avulsion. Um, yeah. But but uh, even yesterday's one patient, uh, I think Bal Subramaniam, somebody... Yeah. The MCL three months over. The MCL yes, is not yet healed. It's still opening in flexion in uh, thirty degrees. So he is heavy. He's hundred plus. So he's full weight bearing and walking. Uh, so in those patients, uh, he would not listen to us. He would continue. He started riding two wheeler. Mm, so so for those patients, it's just little more protection to have this RO embrace. Okay, sir. Uh, but really compliant patients who have gained their strength uh, sufficiently, if it's only the PCL, then uh, we can discontinue the brace. Okay, sir. So, uh, so we should have a criteria. Yeah. The yeah. knee stable. <clears throat> Correct. So it might vary from patient to patient. Yes, but in the contrary, we've seen patients who, uh, a doctor who had done a PCL alone. Uh, yes. He he bought the osseous brace and he was wearing the osseous brace for six months. So if they are wearing an osseous brace, you cannot say don't wear it. It's going yes. to be protective. And so uh, we can uh, discontinue brace in selected situations. Uh, improving RO. RO, we do increase the RO. Uh, we go uh, past 90. But again, in the situations where MCL is not healed in a multi ligament situation, uh, not to push the arm more than 90 if MCL is not yet healed, which okay, might, uh, uh, but in an isolated PCL, you have to do more than 90 by six weeks. Yes, sir. Okay, sir. What is the last point? Isolated quad? What um, is the thing which we. So, do? isolated quad strengthening is leg extension exercise. Huh. Sorry, uh, the isolated hamstring, leg curl should be delayed. So, leg extension and leg curls on the machine we start on the same day so most of the studies they recommend starting this leg curl exercises uh, in a later stage so for pcl so, for pcl yeah. it's going to take the to be a back okay. yes yes so when do we start this so we start by four months and um, we start on the same day itself whenever we're starting isolated so four months for a leg curl is okay but uh, is it okay? Leg extensions can be started early on the other okay. day. Okay, okay, okay. Probably that's what the literature says. Yeah. Four months is, uh, we were doing it already late only. Okay, some some studies, they recommend starting after six months. Sir. Six months. They don't even train hamstrings till six months. So, so Ganesh, yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, Sir, uh, the hamstrings uh, and uh, the hip extension, both of the exercise in PCL, we don't do in the initial two months. Uh, 
because when they do an extension also there is going to be some amount of uh, contraction coming from the hamstrings so we have stopped the isometrics and the hip extension until the first uh, two months as uh, paul said the hamstring strengthening we start delayed uh, <clears throat> and uh, patient is already having the brace and uh, the with with the brace even though if we can put it in 120 degree the ideal range what we will get is just about 100 to 90 and uh, we we delay the hamstring until unless they don't get a very good uh, quadriceps uh, strength we don't start the hamstrings uh, but in the long run some of the cases when we have seen them in one year and one and a half years they have improved uh, but the first point, what Paul said, that the range is when they try to uh, uh, come and complain that, can I bend it a little bit more or so. Okay. And the brace also, sir, uh, like uh, sometimes in MCL and other uh, uh, co-associated uh, soft tissues, we keep it for up to four months. And sometimes three months, uh, if they have uh, followed up things, Third month also it's been discarded, but I think we can have a consensus saying that at the third month, we can take a call to see whether it is to be continued for one more month or uh, that can be discarded. Okay, so we'll stick to the protocol, but we'll keep it patient uh, tailored. Uh, in isolated PCLs, we might uh, start it early as suggested. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Paul. See, the, the, the very reason <clears throat> why we give the... I'm sorry. The brace in six months is how patients start squatting the moment they can flex any around 90. The Muslim patients will start namas the very moment they can get about 90. Uh, earlier, long back, uh, I used to get a lot of these issues. So that's why I started counseling them properly. No namas for one year, two years or whatever. And then gave the brace uh, for six months to just uh, drive into the brain that uh, this is an operation which cannot be taken lightly as for the rehab is concerned, you had to wait. That's why we had uh, given brace for six months. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank so you, sir. Stick to the protocol. Uh, maybe in selected situation, we can shorten it. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Paul. That's all is over? Praveen. So Praveen. 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 Is my screen visible, sir? Yeah. Ah, yes. Yeah. So... I'll just be uh, quickly running about the uh, literature uh, review we have. I mean, the, basically, just a literature review regarding what, where we stand with regards to internal bracing in ACL, with regards to ACL repair as well as with uh, ACL uh, reconstruction. Uh, so, internal bracing is a fairly new uh, idea introduced as recent as 2015, this uh, article by McKay et al. And following that, so there are only very few studies. Uh, uh, having uh, re regards to the clinical outcomes following ACL repairs and uh, ACL reconstruction with, with internal bracing. So with regards to ACL repair and internal bracing, this is the only uh, uh, review article I found with uh, published in the, the Knee Journal by uh, <coughs> Wilson et al., including nine studies and 347 patients. Again, the maximum mean follow-up in this review, again, is only up to 2.7 years. And I didn't come across any uh, randomized control trials or meta-analysis for ACL reconstruction and bracing in any of the standard uh, arthroscopy related journals. So just quickly looking into this review. Uh, so these are the studies uh, uh, in this uh, review where they have included nine studies. Uh, so again, if you look at the studies, the mean sample size is around 30 patients, only 30 patients in each study. Maximum sample size are only uh, uh, 93 and uh, 60 uh, in two studies. Again, uh, looking at the mean follow-up, the mean follow is only 2.7 years. The maximum data regarding follow-up we have is only for up to 5.7 years. That one just one study. 
and looking at the failure rates, uh, it fairly varied failure rates and average failure rates about 10.4%. Uh, uh, so looking at the key results of this review, uh, none of the studies are level one or level two studies. There are only three uh, level three studies, just a level four studies. No studies are blind or randomized. And uh, all studies have uh, mentioned the uh, reoperation rates were similar to ACL. Uh, and reoperation rates not necessarily meaning uh, revision ACL. Uh, with respect to other procedures like uh, uh, removal of hardware for subsequent irritation and uh, other meniscal injuries. And with regards to use of internal bracing in pediatric population, they are advocating a routine removal uh, at three months to avoid uh, any possible growth disturbance uh, as per one study. And there are no objective difference in laxity with, the with and without the use of uh, internal bracing in uh, ACL repair. Uh, so, uh, as discussed, the, the data we have, which is the ma uh, maximum available data as of now, is with uh, 347 patients and a mean follow-up of only 2.7 years with regards to ACL repair and internal bracing. Uh, if you look at the failure rates, it's about 10.4% uh, uh, failure rate, uh, just even at uh, 2.7 years of follow-up. And this is slightly higher than compared to standard uh, ACL reconstruction failure rates. And the failure rate seems to increase with uh, the younger age. In the less than 18 years, failure rate has a 37 percent. And an interesting thing uh, point to note is that uh, there was only one study with a follow-up of five years. Uh, if you look at the failure rate in that study, the failure rate is uh, more than the average failure rate, failure rate of about 16 percent. Uh, point to be noted is that uh, this is similar to the studies when ACL repair was initially tried in the prior to 2000s, where uh, the results were promising at the initial uh, two-year period. However, there were uh, very poor results at the uh, midterm follow-up. So, uh, with that, reading, revision rates were as high as 50% following repair. So, the data regarding that aspect with uh, following ACL repair internal bracing is not yet known. And also, there's a lot of uh, confounding factors. Like most of the studies were from the innovators who are uh, advocating and promoting the internal bracing uh, device. And also, there's no not much documentation regarding uh, return to sports following in ACL repair and tunnel bracing. So most of the studies, uh, they advocate that can be considered as a viable option. Again, uh, the reasons they put forward is the reasons for repair rather than the use of internal bracing. Uh, can, uh, with respect to retain proprioception, no donor side morbidity, and uh, easier uh, ACL deconstruction in case of failures. And however, there are no studies documenting the delay as in chronicity of the tear and the possible repair with internal bracing. So looking at the ACL reconstruction internal bracing, these are the commonly put forward uh, reasons for an additional internal bracing in ACL reconstructions, uh, particularly in ACL revisions and in patients with uh, smaller graphs, particularly uh, graphs of 8 mm or less. And uh, while, while using allografts, particularly in young patients, since the time for integration allografts was a little longer than autographs and in possible high risk for non compliant patients. So I couldn't find any articles in uh, any review articles in uh, Sasta or Anna. So this is the only study which was uh, uh, discussing about uh, long-term results of uh, internal bracing in ACL uh, repair and reconstruction. So this again included 10 biomechanical studies and 13 clinical studies. Of the clinical studies, there are only four, only four were speaking about uh, ACL reconstruction and uh, internal bracing. So these were the biomechanical studies, uh, most of which are published in ANA or JBJS. And with that, they concluded that uh, there is definitely lower graft elongation and the higher uh, failure to uh, ultimate failure road for the graft plus brace construct. And there is no stress shielding on the bone. Uh, so if you look at the clinical studies, as you can see, there are only uh, uh, five studies uh, comparing uh, with the respect to reconstruct internal bracing. Again, one of the studies comparing uh, ACL uh, repair and internal bracing against reconstruction. So, in essence, there are only four studies we have about ACL reconstruction and uh, uh, internal bracing. Again, if you look at the follow-up period in these studies, the maximum data we have is only up to two years follow-up. So, just quickly look into the individual studies. Uh, sorry, the first study is uh, an Indian study published in the International Journal of Orthopedic Sciences. So again, from uh, KGMU Lucknow, it's not an index journal, and uh, again, very minimal follow-up. After only six months, I couldn't find any further follow-ups with the study. And uh, another study is by uh, Bodan for a uh, retard, uh, uh, by, which includes uh, 60 patients with uh, 
30 patients with uh, suture augmented ACLR against standard ACLR. Again, a two year retrospective follow up study. And they concluded the suture augmentation definitely improved the RM and had less pain and higher uh, return to sports and similar, similar failure rates. Uh, one study by Kirk et al. published in, uh, again in ANA. Again, a retrospective study uh, with comparing 36 patients with ACLR interfacing against 72 with standard ACLRs. Again, follow up is only 32, uh, two years. There are no signal, uh, their results are in favor of ACLR and internal bracing. However, a point to note is the authors of this study are uh, affiliated to Arthrex and they are proponents of the use of uh, Arthrex internal bracing system. Uh, and last study is again a case series, it's non comparative with 37 patients. Again, follow up only 12 months, uh, going, showing good results. So, to conclude, uh, internal bracing uh, definitely reduces uh, graft elongation. And there's no reported severe adverse effects with the use of internal bracing in terms of any immunoinflammatory reactions. Uh, and definite biomechanical studies convincingly show that it helps in early post op protection of the grafts and aids in healing. So, can be as put forward in more studies, can be considered in patients with uh, small grafts or in a possible uncomplained patients like an athletes or in uh, obese patients. So take home. So the data we have regarding ACLR, internal ACL and internal bracing, either with regards to repair or reconstruction is very scarce. The maximum data we have is only up to five years. And uh, so long-term results are await awaited. The biomechanical studies definitely support the use of internal bracing. Uh, again, depending on the uh, 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 selective, uh, um, depending on patient selection. So uh, results, long-term results of ACL repair are still not uh, convincingly known and if considered maybe ACL deconstruction internal bracing can be considered type 1 and type 2 proximal ACL tests in adults since there are very high failure rates in children and uh, ACL reconstruction and internal bracing may be considered if additional cost is not an issue in patients with uh, small grafts or with patients with uh, suspected uh, non-compliance like uh, very highly active or obese patients. Uh, thank you sir. Uh, thanks, Praveen. Uh, well done. You know, I just want to uh, do this uh, so that because a lot, of, a lot of patients in the OP are asking for, for it. Uh, how many Sorry, cases that, have they done in Lucknow? Uh, very minimal. So 25, I think. Yeah, 25 All against right, 25. Yes. So. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Sir. One doubt to clear. Uh, Praveen, now this graft elongation was tested for hamstrings. Huh? Yes, sir. That's Any more of biomechanical studies, sir. Anything comparing PTB? Uh, no, sir. I didn't come across anything. All for just hamstrings, sir. No. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Sir, uh, shall we end the session, sir? Yeah, please, please. Sir. Thank you all. Goodbye. Good night, Kopal. Good night. Good night. Good night.